Chapter eighteen of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter eighteen Odds and Ends. The spring in rock, or, as it was sometimes by a curious perversion called the rock in spring, was a spring running out of a cave like fissure in a high limestone cliff. Here the old man sheltered himself on that dreary Christmas evening until Bud brought his roan colt to the top of the cliff above, and he and Rolf helped the old man up the cliff and into the saddle. Rolf went back to bed, but Bud, who was only too eager to put in his best licks, walked by the side of old John Pearson the six miles over to Buckeye Run, and at last, after eleven o'clock, he deposited him in a hollow sycamore by the road, there to wait the coming of the mail wagon that would carry him into Jackson County. "'Good-bye,' said the basket-maker, as Bud mounted the colt to return. "'If I'm wanted, just send me word, and I'll make a forward movement any time. "'I don't like this air thing of running off in the night-time. "'But I reckon General Winfield Scott would a ordered a retreat if he'd a been in my shoes. "'I'm lots obliged to you. "'Accordin' to my tell, we're all of us selfish in everything. "'But I'll be dog owned if I don't believe you and one or two more is exceptions.' Whether it was that the fact that Pete Jones had got considerable shuck up demoralized his followers, or whether it was that the old man's flight was suspected, the mob did not turn out in very great force, and the tarring was postponed indefinitely, for by the time they came together it became known, somehow, that the man with the wooden leg had outrun them all. But the escape of one devoted victim did not mollify the feelings of the people toward the next one. By the time Bud returned, his arm was very painful, and the next day he went under Dr. Small's treatment to reduce the fracture. Whatever suspicions Bud might have of Pete Jones, he was not afflicted with Rolf's dread of the silent young doctor. And if there was anything Small admired, it was physical strength and courage. Small wanted Bud on his side, and least of all did he want him to be Rolf's champion, so that the silent, cool, and skillful doctor went to work to make an impression on Bud Means. Other influences were at work upon him also. Mrs. Means volleyed and thundered in her usual style about his taken up with a one-legged thief and runnin' arter that master that was a mighty suspicious kind of a customer, accordin' to her tell. She'd allers said so. If she'd a been consulted, he wouldn't a been hired. He warn't fit company for nobody. And old Jack Means, loud bud must want to have their barns burnt, like some other folkses had been. For his part, he had sense enough to know they was some people as it wouldn't do to set a body's self again, and as for him, he didn't butt his brains out again a buckeye tree, not when he was sober. And so they managed, during Bud's confinement to the house, to keep him well supplied with all the ordinary discomforts of life. But one visit from Martha Hawkins, ten words of kindly inquiry from her, and the remark that his broken arm reminded her of something she had seen at the East, and something somebody said the time she was to Boston, were enough to repay the champion a thousandfold for all that he suffered. Indeed, that visit, and the recollection of Rolf saying that Jesus Christ was a sort of flat creaker himself, were manna in the wilderness to Bud. Poor Shockey was sick. The excitement had been too much for him, and though his fever was very slight, it was enough to produce just a little delirium. Either Rolf or Miss Martha was generally at the cabin. "'They're coming,' said Shockey to Rolf. "'They're coming. Pete Jones is a-going to bind me out for a hundred years. I wish Hanner would hold me so's he couldn't. God's forgot all about us here in Flat Creek, and there's nobody to help it.' And he shivered at every sudden sound. He was never free from this delirious fright except when the master held him tight in his arms. He staggered around the floor, the very shadow of Shockey, and was so terrified by the approach of darkness that Rolf stayed in the cabin on Wednesday night, and Miss Hawkins stayed on Thursday night. On Friday, Bud sent a note to Rolf, asking him to come and see him. "'You see, Mr. Hartsook, I hain't forgotten what was said about putting in our best licks for Jesus Christ. I've been a-trying to read some about him while I set here.' and I read where he said something about doin' for the least of his brethren being as the same like as if it was done for Jesus Christ his self. Now there's Shockey, I reckon. Perhaps as anybody is a little brother of Jesus Christ, it is that Shockey. 
Pete Jones and his brother Bill is determined to have him back there to Marie. Because, you see, Pete's one of the county commissioners, and to Marie's the day that they bind out. He wants to bind out that boy just to spite old Pearson and you and me. You see, the old woman's been helped by the neighbors, and he'll claim Shocky to be a pauper, and they ain't no human soul here as dares to do a thing contrary to Pete. Couldn't you get him over to Lewisburg? I'll lend you my roan colt. Ralph thought a minute. He dared not take Shocky to the uncle's where he found his only home. But there was Miss Nancy Sawyer, the old maid who was everybody's blessing. He could ask her to keep him, and at any rate he would save Shocky somehow. As he went out in the dusk, he met Hannah in the lane. End of chapter 18